This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 33. Coming up on Space Time, a new model for nova explosions, Mars quakes detected on the red planet, and new physics needed to try and explain contradictions in the Hubble constant. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists will need to go back to the drawing boards to come up with new ways in which powerful explosions known as novae can occur on the surfaces of white dwarf stars. A report in the Astrophysical Journal suggests traditional explanations for nova events will need to be revised following new observations. A nova, or new star, is a massive thermonuclear explosion on the surface of a star known as a white dwarf. White dwarfs are the stellar remnants of sun-like stars. Stars shine by fusing hydrogen in their core into helium. When these stars run out of hydrogen, hydrostatic equilibrium, that's the balancing act between the outwards push of nuclear energy and the inwards push of gravity, ceases, and gravity wins, causing the star's core to dramatically contract and compress. Now, as the star's core contracts inwards, its outer gaseous envelope expands outwards, where, being further away from the core, it cools down and turns the star into a red giant. Meanwhile, all that inwards compression on the core is increasing pressure and temperature there. Eventually, it gets so hot and the pressure gets so great that helium in the core, that's what the hydrogen's all been converted into, starts to fuse together, forming carbon and oxygen. Eventually, the helium in the core will also run out. But because sun-like stars aren't big enough, aren't massive enough, to cause the carbon and oxygen in their cores to fuse into even heavier elements, the star dies. The dying star's outer gaseous envelope begins to separate from the core and float away as a planetary nebula. And the now exposed white-hot stellar core, which we call a white dwarf by this stage, is left behind to slowly cool over the eons of time. But it doesn't end there. You see, if a white dwarf is in a close binary system with another star, then the white dwarf's intense gravity can draw material off the outer gaseous envelope of that companion star. And this material gradually builds up on the surface of the white dwarf until pressures and temperatures increase enough to trigger a thermonuclear eruption, a nova. This eruption isn't powerful enough to completely destroy the star as in a supernova, but it's bright enough to briefly outshine many of the surrounding stars. Because the white dwarf isn't destroyed by this blast, it can continue to draw more material off its stellar companion, eventually triggering another nova event, and so the cycle continues. Our story concerns tiny silicon carbide grains which are born in nova explosions. And these grains can be found today embedded in meteorites. One of the study's authors, Maitre V. Bose from Arizona State University, says silicon carbide is one of the most resistant materials found in meteorites. And unlike other elements, these stardust grains have survived literally unchanged from before the solar system was born. Because novae can erupt over and over again, they can repeatedly throw vast amounts of gas and dust into surrounding space. And from there, these dust grains merge with clouds of interstellar gas to become the ingredients for new star systems. In fact, our Sun and Solar System were born 4.6 billion years ago from just such an interstellar cloud, seeded with dust grains from earlier stellar eruptions from many different kinds of stars. Almost all the original grains were consumed in making the sun and planets, yet a tiny fraction have remained. Today, these bits of stardust, or pre-solar grains as astronomers like to call them, can be identified in primitive solar system materials such as chondritic meteorites. Bose says the key to her work was identifying the isotopic composition of the stardust grains. Isotopes are varieties of chemical elements that have extra neutrons in their nuclei. Isotopic analysis allowed the authors to trace the raw materials that came together to form the solar system. Each silicon carbide grain carries a signature of the isotopic composition of its parent star. And this provides a probe for that star's nuclear synthesis, in other words, how it made elements. Bose collected published data on thousands of grains and found that nearly all of them could be grouped naturally into just three major categories, each attributable to one kind of star or another. 
However, there are around 30 grains which couldn't be traced back to any particular stellar origin. In the analysis, these grains were simply flagged as possibly originating from nerve explosions. But did they? And that's where the study's co-author, Summer Starfield, yes, that's his real name, from Arizona State University, comes into the picture. Starfield found that the initial evaluations weren't agreeing with either the astronomical observations or with Bose's results. So the pair turned to multidimensional studies of classical nerve explosions and put together a completely new way of doing model calculations. There are two major composition classes for nova based on their spectra. There are oxygen neon novae and carbon oxygen novae, which produce lots of dust as part of the explosion itself. The idea is that these carbon oxygen nerve explosions reach down deep into the white dwarf's carbon oxygen core, bringing up all these enhanced and enriched elements. And these in turn can drive a much bigger explosion, shooting out tendrils of hot dust, sheets, blobs, jets and clumps. Starfield's calculations predicted that 35 isotopes, including those of carbon, nitrogen, silicon, sulfur and aluminum, could be created through carbon-oxygen nova outbursts. But then, when they compared their predictions to the published compositions of silicon carbide grains, they only found 5 matches out of the roughly 30 grains suspected of originating in novae. It means something else, something new that they don't understand must be going on. So the pair are now working to try and explain the composition of those grains that didn't come from nerve outbursts. What all this means is that there's a completely new stellar source or sources out there waiting to be discovered. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Now, while we're on the subject of novae, astronomers have discovered that shock waves generated during nova explosions can dramatically amplify their power and brightness. In a typical year, there are around 50 nova explosions across the stellar expanse of the Milky Way galaxy. The problem is, some of these explosions are so bright and powerful, they exceed the scale of scientific explanation. But a study reported in the journal Nature Astronomy has found that these, let's call them superluminous nervi, are being amplified by shock waves, which are dominating the entire explosion. Astronomers have long thought that the energy from a nova was being driven by the white dwarf, controlling how much light and energy is emitted. Instead, what this new research has found is that when the explosion begins, at first there's an injection of relatively cooler, slower waves of gaseous material. But right behind it is a far hotter, faster moving wave, which eventually ploughs into the other wave. The collision of these two ejections then produces a shock wave, which results in a spectacular explosion of heat and light. And the bigger the shock wave, the brighter the nova. The authors believe the speed of the second wave is what influences the power of the explosion. The nova in this study, Assassin 16MA, was discovered back in 2016 by the Ohio State University's All-Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae, Assassin. Assassin is a suite of robotic telescopes spread across the globe. The observations collected from all these sources provide data on the amount of energy being released and in which frequencies that radiation is being expressed. The findings can then be extrapolated to try and better understand other stellar explosions like supernovae. One of the study's authors is astronomer Paul Lacus from the University of Western Australia and the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. And interestingly, he made his contributions not using the university's telescopes or those of ICAR, but using his own backyard telescope. Nova is a Latin term originally. It was the full derivation is, is Nova Stella, which means new star, because as humans, we've been noticing the apparition of new stars for several thousand years. So Nova has its leftovers from the ancient Greek, and over the last couple of millennia, there's been a couple of fairly bright ones, and the name has kind of stuck. So Nova is basically just a new star. They tend to repeat themselves. A, a star will brighten up and then dim down again after a period of time, and it can repeat that procedure 10, 20, 50 years down the track. Well, exactly. And in fact, it's, it's, not re- it's not actually a new star. It's a star that's always been there. It's just that we've suddenly noticed it because it's become incredibly brighter. And most Nova, we believe, are recurrent in in that they will brighten and dim continuously over their lifetimes. But most of the ones that we've found have only brightened once in their lifetimes. So you do get recurrent Nova that brighten 
over the course of years or decades, but then there are Nova that we've only seen brighten once and then they've faded away again. As evidenced by this recent paper, I, I guess we're still trying to figure out the specifics of the astrophysics that's going on, but we have a pretty good model which consists of a red giant and a white dwarf interacting and uh, periodically on the accretion disk of the white dwarf we'll get these thermonuclear reactions that uh, cause this massive brightening over the course of a short period of days or weeks. You played a pretty significant role in this. The telescopes that we have in our backyard are actually very capable of doing significant science. In the case of spectroscopy where we're trying to figure out what it is we're looking at I just simply pointed my telescope to what was still at that stage just a discovery of a new bright object we didn't know that it was a nova, we just knew that it was a, a new bright object. But by taking a spectra, we actually determined that it was a nova by looking at the various emission and absorption lines that exist typically in these in these types of objects. Nova are incredibly interesting objects. They're actually a, a red giant star, which is obviously a star similar to our sun, but with the size out to about the planet Mars or Jupiter, accompanied by an incredibly dense white dwarf star, which is a star with the mass of our sun compressed into an object about the size of the Earth. So there's some incredibly massive physics going on in these systems as they interact with one another. And only by taking a spectra of that phenomena can we actually determine that it is in fact an over and not an asteroid or uh, some other transient event. By looking at the spectra, there seem to be two primary peaks there. The emission lines that you're talking about are probably the hydrogen emission lines that are caused by this rapidly expanding shell of gas that's explosively moving away from the system. But there'll be other elements in there as well. And NOVA are typically classified according to the sorts of elements that we see. And they are commonly things like iron or helium uh, and sometimes some other exotic elements as well. We're mostly interested in things like chemical composition, but also temperature. In the case of NOVA, of course, we're also very interested in the changes because NOVA tend to, the spectrum that you're looking at will change very rapidly over a few days and it will enter different phases as this expanding shell of gas and the shockwave accompanying it move out into space. So over a very short time frame, measured typically in days or weeks for the fast NOVA, you'll see that spectrum change quite dramatically. And it ends up looking like the spectrum that we would get if we looked at, say, a nebula, where we would see strong emission lines in areas such as oxygen and nitrogen. Tell me about the Astronomer's Telegraph. Astronomer's Telegram has existed for quite a while, obviously, I think, probably back to the days when we actually did have telegrams. And it is just a way of letting the professional community know that something very interesting is going on and perhaps people might want to point their telescopes at it. So it's used as a sort of a first alert kind of system and in my case, submitting an astronomer's telegram enabled other professional astronomers to not only know that I'd captured a spectra, but also then make contact with me over the course of the next few months in order to collaborate on the research. And this is really important when you're looking at some fairly ephemeral type of objects in the sky, things that aren't going to be there for long, not like a, a planet or a galaxy or a star, which will be there for ages and ages and ages, but things that happen once only or, or very fleetingly. Yeah, and in fact, we lump all of these events into a big category that we call transient astronomy. So anything that sort of comes and goes fairly quickly, I guess, can be characterised by that style of event. And you'll typically see those sorts of things reported in astronomical telegrams. You won't often see a piece of research on a static object that's existed for years and years. But if something suddenly changes, like a comet or a chunk of an asteroid hits the cloud belt of Jupiter, then you'll probably see something reported as, a, as an astronomical telegram because it's a, a transient event. This basically alerts astronomers that there's something in the sky worth pointing their telescopes at and getting a good look at. And that's what you you did, and you were lucky to see this object because it was fairly down deep in the western horizon, I believe. Yes, and um, you know, this is one of the reasons that amateurs are usually quite successful at these sorts of things because we're a slightly more light-footed sort of initiative. We can point our telescopes in parts of the skies that a lot of the larger initiatives won't bother or probably can't physically or mechanically sometimes. And this particular nova was one of two that I confirmed in one week that were both very low in the western sky just after sunset. In fact, I had to choose which of the two I was going to take spectra of on any particular night during that week because I couldn't do both at the same time. By the time I'd finished one, the other one had already uh, set. So we are kind of lucky to be able to be the owner operators of our telescopes and choose which part of the sky we're going to view without having to worry too much about large bureaucracy. That's Paul Larkas from the University of Western Australia and ICAR, the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A Mars quake has been recorded for the first time ever by NASA's Mars InSight lander. 
The faint seismic signal detected by the lander's seismic experiment was recorded on April the 6th, the lander's 128th Martian day, or Sol. This is the first recorded rumble that appears to have come from inside the planet, as opposed to being caused by forces above the surface, such as winds. Scientists are still examining the data to determine the exact cause of the signal. Insight's principal investigator, Bruce Bannett from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says this first event officially kicks off a new field of science, Martian seismology. However, this new seismic event was too small to provide any solid data on the Martian interior, which is one of Insight's main objectives. The Martian surface is extremely quiet, allowing Insight's specially designed seismometer to pick up really faint rumbles. Now, by contrast, Earth's surface is constantly quivering from seismic noise created by people, oceans, weather, all sorts of things. An event the size of this Mars quake, were it recorded in, say, Southern California, would have been lost among the dozens of tiny crackles that occur there each day. Laurie Glaze from NASA's Planetary Science Division says the Martian Sol 128 event is exciting because its size and longer duration fits the profile of moonquakes, which were detected on the lunar surface during the Apollo missions. NASA's Apollo astronauts installed five seismometers on the lunar surface that measured thousands of quakes while operating on the moon between 1969 and 1977, revealing there's a fair bit of lunar seismic activity. Different materials can change the speed of seismic waves or reflect them completely, thereby allowing scientists to use these waves to learn about the interior structure of the moon and then model its formation. Of course, NASA is currently planning to return astronauts to the moon by 2024, in the process laying the foundation that will eventually enable human exploration of Mars. InSight Seismometer, which the lander placed on the red planet's surface on December the 19th last year, will enable scientists to gather similar data about Mars. By studying the deep interior of Mars, astronomers hope to learn how other terrestrial rocky worlds, including the Earth and the Moon, formed. In addition to the Sol-128 reading, InSight also recorded three other seismic signals. One on March the 14th, that's Sol-105, another on April the 10th, Sol-132, and a third on April the 11th, Sol-133. Detected by InSight's more sensitive very broadband sensors, these signals were even smaller than the Sol-128 event, and therefore much more ambiguous in origin. The team will continue to study these events to try and determine their cause. Regardless of its cause, the Sol-128 signals an exciting milestone for the team because it supports the idea that Mars is still seismically active. Most people are familiar with quakes on Earth, many of which occur on fault lines created by the motion of tectonic plates. Mars and the Moon don't have tectonic plates, but they still experience quakes. In their cases, it's caused by a continual process of cooling contraction, which creates stress. This stress builds up over time, until it's strong enough to break the crust and cause a quake. Detecting these tiny quakes required a huge feat of engineering. On Earth, high-quality seismometers are often sealed in underground vaults in order to isolate them from changes in temperature and weather. InSight's instrument also has several ingenious insulating barriers, including a cover built by JPL called the Wind and Thermal Shield, designed to protect the sensor from the planet's extreme temperature changes and winds. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. New observations are showing that differences in how fast the universe is expanding now compared to how fast it was expanding billions of years ago are no statistical accident. One of the big problems in cosmology is that Hubble's current measurements of the expansion rate of the universe don't seem to match the rate at which it was expanding shortly after the Big Bang some 13.82 billion years ago. Now, for a long time, astronomers and astrophysicists were putting it all down to, well, just a statistical glitch that will even out as more and more information becomes available. But that's not what's happening. And this new data has brought that into even sharper focus. The new data from the Hubble Space Telescope and reported in the Astrophysical Journal, has significantly lowered the possibility that this discrepancy is a fluke. Using the new Hubble observations, researchers were able to improve the foundations of the Cosmic Distance Ladder, which is used to calculate accurate distances to nearby galaxies. This was done by observing pulsating stars known as Cepheid variables in a neighbouring satellite galaxy known as the Large Magellanic Cloud. The new calculations place the Large Magellanic Cloud at some 162,000 light-years away. When defining distances to galaxies that are further and further away, these Cepheid variables are used as cosmic milepost markers. 
Before the Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990, estimates for the Hubble constant varied by a factor of two. In the late 1990s, the Hubble Space Telescope's key project on the extragalactic distance scale refined the value of the Hubble constant to within 10% in the process accomplishing one of the telescope's key goals. Then in 2016, astronomers using Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding between 5 and 9% faster than was previously calculated. Their refining measurements reduced the Hubble constant's level of uncertainty to just 2.4%. The following year, 2017, an independent measurement supported these results. Now this latest research has reduced the uncertainty in their Hubble constant value to an unprecedented 1.9%. So you can see they're really targeting in on what this measurement of the expansion rate of the universe really is. The research also suggests that the likelihood that this discrepancy between measurements of today's expansion rate of the universe and the expected value based on the early universe's expansion is a fluke, is just 1 in 100,000. A significant improvement on previous estimates last year of 1 in 3,000. The study's lead author, Adam Rees, from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, and Johns Hopkins University, says this Hubble tension between the early and late universe may be the most exciting development in cosmology in decades. He says the mismatch has been growing and has now reached a point that is really impossible to dismiss simply as a fluke. As the team's measurements have become more and more precise, their calculations of the Hubble constant have remained inconsistent with the expected value derived from observations of the early universe's expansion made by the European Space Agency's Planck satellite. Planck's measurements mapped a remnant afterglow of the Big Bang known as the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, which helped scientists predict how the early universe would likely have evolved into the expansion rate astronomers can measure today. Our new 2019 estimate for the Hubble constant is 74.03 kilometers per second per megaparsec. What all that means is that for every 3.3 million light years further away a galaxy is from us, it appears to be moving away from us at 74 kilometers per second faster simply as a result of the expansion of the universe. The number indicates that the universe is now expanding at a rate some 9% faster than that implied by the Planck observations of the early universe, which gave a value for the Hubble constant of 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. To reach their conclusions, recent colleagues analyzed the light from some 70 Cepheid variables in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Because these stars all brighten and dim at predictable rates, and the periods for these variations give scientists their luminosity and hence their distance, astronomers use them as cosmic mileposts. Rhesus' team used an observing technique known as Drift and Sift. Drift and Sift uses Hubble as a point-and-shoot camera in order to snap quick images of bright stars. This avoids the more time-consuming step of anchoring the telescope with guide stars in order to observe each star independently. The results were then combined with independent observations made by collaboration between astronomers from institutions in Europe, Chile and the United States to measure the distance to the Large Magellanic Cloud by observing the dimming of light as one star passes in front of its partner star in a binary star system. Because cosmological models suggest that observed values for the expansion of the universe should be the same as those determined by the cosmic microwave background, new physics may well be needed in order to explain this disparity. Various scenarios, which we've covered previously on Space Time and on its predecessor Star Stuff, have been proposed to explain this discrepancy. But as yet, there's still been no conclusive answer. One idea is that invisible form of matter known as dark matter, which may be interacting more strongly with normal matter than astronomers had previously thought. Or perhaps dark energy is the key. This unknown form of energy that seems to pervade the entire universe may be responsible for this accelerating expansion of the cosmos. Either way, our overall understanding of the ultimate fate of the universe depends on a better understanding of the Hubble constant. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Climate change is now threatening the world's doomsday vault, which houses one of the planet's largest seed banks. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault was opened in February 2008 by the Norwegian government as the ultimate failsafe for the biodiversity of Earth's crops. It's located on the island of Svalbard, just down the road from the northernmost town in the world. Northern temperatures and the Arctic environment on the island were the main reason for its construction. However, worsening global warming brought about by the use of fossil fuels has now placed the facility in peril, 
because the polar region where it's located is warming faster than any other area of the planet. That's because the Arctic is less able to reflect sunlight away from the polar seas due to the disappearing ice and snow cover. The world's second largest colony of emperor penguins has been almost wiped out, with thousands of chicks drowning after their colony was hit by unusually severe weather. Reports by the British Antarctic Survey say the penguins' Halley Bay colony on Antarctica's Weddell Sea Ice Sheet has been destroyed, wiping out up to 9% of the world's entire emperor penguin population. Scientists warn that the surviving adult birds are showing no signs of re-establishing the population. Meanwhile, a new study has found that extreme ocean winds and wave heights are increasing around the globe, with the largest rise occurring in the Southern Ocean. The study by the University of Melbourne compared measurements from more than 80 ocean buoys deployed worldwide. The findings, reported in the journal Science, represent the largest and most detailed data set of its type ever compiled. The fabella, a small bone in a tendon behind the knee which was once rare in humans, is becoming more and more common. A study by scientists from Imperial College London has found that between 1918 and 2018, the rate of flabellae occurrence, yes, that's the right way, the rate of flabellae occurrence in humans has increased more than threefold. They found that flabella were present in 11.2% of the world's population back in 1918. But by 2018, that had grown to some 39%. The highest rates reported appear to be in Australians and people from Asia, while the lowest rates occur in Europeans and South Americans. Having a flabella is considered a normal variant in human anatomy. It grows in a tendon of muscle, though its exact function is unknown. Scientists think it may help reduce friction within tendons, or possibly reducing or even increasing muscle forces. The flabella is more common in non-human mammals, suggesting a role in locomotion. Having a flabella does have its drawbacks. People with osteoarthritis around the knee are twice as likely to have one. But as to exactly why this tiny bone is making a comeback, scientists simply don't know. Speculation is that it could lie in better nutrition, as the greatest increases tend to parallel increases in nutrition in those countries. Paleontologists have unearthed a new species of hadrosaur dinosaur in Mongolia. A report in the journal PLOS One claims the complete skeletal remains of the new species, which has been named Gobi hadros, fills the gap in science's understanding of the evolution of hadrosaurs, which were the dominant herbivores of the late Cretaceous period between 66 and 100 million years ago. Paleontologists say the remains found at the dig site include a three-metre skeleton that doesn't quite fit the family Hadrosaurida, but which is a very close cousin, making it the first such dinosaur known from complete remains from the late Cretaceous of Central Asia. There are a few more evil acts than those of the racists and bigots who deny the Holocaust, the murder of more than six million Jews, a million Romani, and tens of thousands of gay men, all of whom were persecuted, tortured, and killed by the Nazis and their willing puppets during World War II simply because of their genetic heritage. Of course, these history revisionists spewing out their lies and cherry-picked half-truths for racist or political propaganda have always been there. But in the age of social media and identity politics, it's become a growing problem. And how many recent or modern-day political figures can you think of who are busily rewriting their own actions to give themselves a better posture in history? Now, let's be clear here, we are not talking about legitimate researchers seeking truth in the historical and archaeological record subject to the accepted scientific peer review process. We're talking about those who would deliberately erase the truth, substituting it with their own twisted narrative. On May the 15th, Perth Skeptics will be holding a pub meeting at the Vic Hotel, 226 Hay Street in Subiaco. They'll be looking at Holocaust denial, one aspect of history revisionism. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics joins us now to look at the motives behind history revisionism. It's, it's racism, it's fearism, it's fear of uh, governments, it's fear of it's people. It's a lot of politics, I dare say. Racism might be one of them, but I mean, rewriting history has been around for a long time, and creating history. Um, you only need to look at the study historiography, which is the study of writing history, to realise that people have been, been manipulating what's been supposedly happened to their own ends. The Holocaust denial, denial is one thing, of course. Uh, all sorts of things in the sceptical world, specifically, psychics often rewrite history. They claim to have actually made a prediction about a certain event. Classic things, you know, assassination of Kennedy and all sorts 
reports or stuff like that, when in fact they haven't. And you look back at what they did say, and very few people do that, but the sceptics do because they're spoiled sports. Sceptics go back and check the claims, and often you find out that it's not quite as accurate uh, as people have said. Same for psychics who say they help police find a body or solve a murder, etc. When you actually look into it, most of the times they've just sort of phoned up a police that says the body's here, and 99.9% of the cases are they're wrong. They're probably 100% actually they're wrong, as most police would say. And But the psychic then goes off and claims that they help police find the body. For sceptics, as you say, they're looking at the Holocaust denial, which is uh, one of the probably the, the, the biggest rewritings of history. It's one of the most evil but, ones too, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty evil. I mean, it is evil. It is. It must be racism, anti-Jew, anti-Semite view there that it's even suggesting that this never happened. One only needs to look at the population of Poland and the change from pre-war and post-war as to how many Jews there used to be there and how many um, there are now. Even even now, it's a very low number. Yeah, these things go on all the time, unfortunately. History's fair game. Yeah, as people say, uh, winners write history, losers don't. But in these cases, you're probably getting people who wished history had a different outcome and therefore write it that way. We can extrapolate that even to journalism today. Journalism is the first draft of history. And yet it is so biased or one-sided when reporting events these days. The idea of the impartial journalist just reporting what they see seems to have disappeared. Yeah, I think it's often the case of the uh, less than impartial publisher as well. Putting a certain tone, that's obvious. Uh, when you get the same story covered in two totally different ways, taken two different angles, you can do that with history. It's when you get that, that constantly happening, a bias one way or the other without anything positive to say about the other, the other side or one particular side, you can see that it's journalism is uh, in the eye of the beholder. Or is, this is the same as What's a silo thinking? Uh, it's preaching yeah. to the choir where you only look at the information that's already on your side of your point of view and you don't look at uh, alternatives, which is very sad. But it's a shame that now, with the rise of... Um blogging, individual journalism, Facebook, you name it. There's a lot of stuff which is out there called journalism. I mean, you're talking about mainstream journalism, but that in, in many cases is actually influenced by what's happening on social media, and social media is, is rife with, with bias. Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah, when I, was, when I was a lad back in the olden days, I caught a dinosaur to work, of course. I, of course, yeah. I was taught that journalism had to be unbiased. You, you had to provide just what you see, just the truth, yeah. and you had to dig that out. Nowadays, when kids study journalism at uni, they're actually taught you can't help but be biased in what you're reporting. And that's, that's wrong. That is, that is yeah, so wrong. Uh, yeah, I mean, sort of, uh, this is the change of, of, of the profession from reporter to commentator. Yes, yeah. And uh, social media has a lot to do with that. Yeah, it does, it does. But it's, it's, it's been a, a, a trend we've having a long time. Basically, reporting is an expensive process. You've got to send people out to do things, to meet people. People talk on the phone. They used to journalists used to write one story a day, one decent story a day. I was a radio journalist. I had to write five to eight stories a day. None of this one story a day newspaper stuff. Oh, you poor suffering person! I, I was working in trade press. I had to edit the whole magazine in half a day and then do the rest. <laughs> Um, yes, I know. And because we, we, we've cut backs in, in sort of budgets of, of mainstream journalism, now those reporters who used to do one story now have to do five. So they're increasingly relying on external sources, which are often biased. Also, it's easier to write a comment piece and to do the, the same number of words than it is to go out and report a story. So everyone wants to be a commentator these days. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.